Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a brand new virtual cafecito lecture. Um, this is a uh, part of the Honrando Nuestra Historia series of events, which is the first time that the Florida Public Archaeology Network hosts this type of series uh, in celebration of National Latina Heritage Month here in the United States. And Helenia, thank you so much for accepting to be one of our wonderful and first speakers of the our visual cafecito lectures. Uh, today, like I mentioned, our guest is Helenia Trinidad Rivera. She is a wonderful Boricua historian, archaeologist, anthropologist, and she recently graduated from uh, NYU with a master's in Latin American and Caribbean studies. And she works a lot on independent historical research museology and the colonial curatorial projects that are very focused on collective memory. With that being said, Helenia, the floor is yours. Thank you again. Bueno, buenos días. Hello, everyone. Hola, todos. Um, thank you uh, for this invite. I feel very honored and happy to talk to you a little bit about uh, my heritage uh, within the Caribbean. and. Yes, let's talk about this. Um, as uh, Natalie said, my name is Helenia. My pronouns are she, they, ella, ella. And today I'll take you through a journey of my research. Um, I've uh, done this research or have been doing this research around since 2018 up until 2022. And uh, right now I am going back to this research just to tie some knots and to see how I can expand it more with other collections and other artifacts that can also uh, sort of dialogue with what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and yes. Uh, this uh, journey through this research of mine uh, entails the resistance nature of perishable objects in ways that pushes researchers and scholars to create alternatives and multidisciplinary paths in order to enhance our current knowledge about their significance in our present. Being born and raised in Puerto Rico within a Puerto Rican and Dominican family has become my greatest influence to hold the pen tight and beat between the thread on the Caribbean loom where our story awaits to be read. For Caribbean people to study our culture entails an affirmation of our identity and ownership on how we want our ancestors, our heritage, and our collective memory to be upheld. Um, a people pass a collection story. The indigenous Arawak people have always been a topic of discussion about Caribbeanists, especially archaeologists who become the storytellers that reconstruct a past with the evidence that has survived in the present day. With no surprise, in 1985, the Centro de Investigaciones Indígenas de Puerto Rico, also known as CIIPR or CIIPR, decided to conduct an expedition to the Esequibo River Basin, uh, as you can see in the maps in the screen, in order to live among, study, and commission objects from the YY people, descendants from the Arawak and Caribbean indigenous people that first inhabited the Caribbean and used as a highway, the Caribbean Sea. It has been well studied by diverse archaeologists from and outside the Caribbean, the connections between the Caribbean and the northern region of South America to two different types of analysis. The collection that I'm going to be talking about with all of you today uh, was originally conceived during the 1985 expedition and transferred to Puerto Rico as to the materials from the fieldwork were collected. The reason for this expedition and the collection of objects resides on an ethnological approach to the study of indigenous communities from Puerto Rico's archaeological sites, with contemporary ethnographic fieldwork retrieved from current indigenous communities, descendants from the Arawaks. So the main focus to uh, create this collection was to have it as a collection that they could do comparative analysis with everything else that they were going to excavate in Puerto Rico. So they wanted an ethnographic collection to compare with archeological 
field work that they were later going to conduct. The reason uh, for this expedition, as I said, uh, was just to have this uh, analytical type of comparison and to establish that dialogue. That why white people are not Arawaks themselves, but descend them from the Arawak communities that eventually migrated to the Caribbean. Something to know is that Arawak people were not one group of people, but a collective of diverse groups of people that left many descendant communities. So this is something that I'm gonna talk a little bit briefly uh, in the next slide, but something that sometimes people, I, I guess that when they look at indigenous communities in the Caribbean, maybe they just like put them all in one name when they're very diverse within themselves. So it's not just one community that it is called Tainos, but there's a lot of uh, communities within the Taino community. So that's very important because it shifts our view from thinking about them all the same into thinking that they are very complex, very diverse, and they have like a vast array of differences that are very important to study. Thus, the approach, the approach used for this expedition is in particular in the 1985 shade light upon a quotidian practices and spatial configuration of evidence in the field and b evidence of possible perishable materials that decay and don't survive in Cuban environments. From 18, in 1985 to 2019, the collection had barely survived diverse floods, earthquakes, both Hurricane Irma and Maria, and the inevitable oblivion that most collections faced. Finally, in 2019, the collection was donated to the Museo de Historia, Antropología y Arte at the Universidad de Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras Campus where it is currently allocated within the Centro de Investigaciones Arqueológicas. The images on screen that you can see right now depict the inevitable distance to many collections when lack of resources and beforehand planning combine and create the creation crisis faced globally by many reports stories, if not all. So the images that you see on screen were a little bit after we have retrieved the majority of the collection. One of the main, um, I guess, the rediscoveries was that it was not only one collection, there were three collections. And those three collections were all sort of meshed together. The only one that was kept separately was the ethnographic collection. That was the one that I uh, eventually got the chance to work with. And it was a rediscovery in itself. So the picture that you're seeing on the right was what we thought we had to retrieve. But then one of the, uh, the chief archaeologists, um, Dr. Yvonne Narganes, she um, saw a door that was blocked, the door that's like halfway opened, and that led to the photo on the left. And it was a small room uh, that had a closet and it was full of ethnographic objects. And that's where we found the ethnographic collection of the white white people. Um, in itself, the collection, the entire of this collection and other collections, it was a real hassle to just try to retrieve what we could save. Um, a lot of the uh, boxes, since they were cardboard, uh, they were saggy from the floods that they experienced. So it was very difficult to lift them up because every time that we tried to lift some of them up, everything would just fall down. So there was a lot of bags full of um, different types of shells that just got ripped open. Um, plastic with, with time gets very uh, fragile and breaks from nothing. Um, and that plastic in particular, I mean, it was since 1985. Um, so it was a little bit of a hassle. One of the things that I think that suffer most, and this happens to every collection that I've seen that I work with, is the documentation part of the collection, which is the soul of the collection. Um, that was a little bit hard to retrieve as well. And we managed to salvage as much as we could. Um, and I 
wanted to include these images because even though this happened in Puerto Rico, this has happened all around the world with uh, repositories that um, could you know, manage to keep these collections to repositories that don't have any more occupancy in their spaces. So this is not just because it's the Caribbean that it's happening, it's happening all around the world. Um, and I've seen photos of repositories like, you know, with uh, situations that they have to deal like this in Canada, throughout the United States, in Europe, and you name it. So anyway, let's see what we found. Uh, before diving in any anything else, uh, within this uh, journey through this research, I want to quickly address the indigenous heritage of Puerto Rico. Usually people think about indigenous ancestry in Puerto Rico, like as I was saying before, and mentioned the Tainos or being the last known group to inhabit uh, the archipelago. And think that you know the Tainos were just one people and they just mesh all together in one community. Um, usually, I think that Taino has uh, really stayed with us because Taino was an Arawak word and it was a, a name that the Taino people used in indigenous communities uh, in the Caribbean. And because it is what we have seen in the written records. Another reason why we have kept Taino so close to us and because, and one of the reasons that we also know this name from an indigenous community is because it is a word that has been kept through generation of Puerto Ricans uh, throughout history. So that's another thing that I've recently noticed and that it is, I don't think that it is talked about a lot in academical spaces. Nonetheless, as you can see, Dinos are actually the last group uh, to actually inhabit uh, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean in itself. The names from other communities, except from Arawak and Taino, are used merely to aid scholars to differentiate each group known in the present. So are not the names in which the communities uh, saw themselves or named themselves. For this research, I will focus on a period de la hueca, a uh, huecoi period, due to the evidence of weak patterns in burenas that we have until today. Textiles and weaving, both productions and technologies, have always been an important part of communities to not only create quotidian objects, but as important keys towards community building, affirmation, and collective memory. Although since their perishable nature, rarely textiles and weave objects survive between the evidence recovered in the archaeological record, some objects have proven their relevance, existence, and importance in our indigenous ancestry. Spindle worlds found in the northeastern areas of Puerto Rico depict a knowledge and use of cotton, for example. Meanwhile, burenes, as the ceramic shirt that you see on the screen, present on the reverse bottom imprints of textile patterns. As noted by Luis Chanla de Bay in Von Narganes Torde and Soraya. Serra Collazo. These imprints highlight the possible reuse of an object made by weaving fibers uh, as a base for the molding of a buren plate. Burenes were used as the plates where pan de cassava was made and it still is made to this day. It is a very common practice in some regions in the Amazonas, in the Dominican Republic, in Puerto Rico, and all throughout the Caribbean. As you can see in these images, it is very interesting to see the importance that a weave pattern has in different technologies and within the production of a pan de cassave. Uh, it is very interesting the squeezer that the um, female perceived indigenous woman from the Huawei community uh, in the left photo uh, is using it to uh, insert the cassava. Uh, from the top, and then she uh, pulls it up so that it spans. Uh, this uh, weave pattern in particular, we have all seen it and we have all played with it because it is very similar to the uh, toy. Um, I don't know if you guys have played with it. I hope that you have. It is uh, like a Chinese top type of uh, toy where you put your fingers in it. And if you uh, pull from it, 
it gets it contracts and it traps your your two uh, index fingers. But if you put your index fingers together, it expands and you can take it out. So the same thing happens with how you squeeze uh, cassava. Uh, if you uh, pull it up, it expands and you can put uh, more cassava on top. But then when you pull it down, you can squeeze the cassava juice. And this is a very uh, interesting way of using uh, diverse with patterns to make utilitary uh, objects that you're going to use in various ways. Um, and for me, it was very interesting not only to see this, but to see how diverse this weave pattern is going to be used in so many other objects and how today it is used still in so many objects that we use every single day sometimes, especially in the Caribbean. Growing up seeing many of these patterns still used by artisans today, and even in my parents' dining chairs that Poppy refurbished, it's inevitable to not see an intergenerational muscular memory that has surpassed colonialism and oppression of our indigenous and African ancestry. Thus, these familiar patterns that we still see every day have become an essential part of our identity. So all these patterns have been used in so many different ways. And here you can see how they are used to make these uh, small boxes that in some of the notes that accompany them, it said that it was made to keep the feathers from some of the men leaders within the community. So even within these treasure boxes, how they describe them, it is very interesting to see the same pattern that you saw in the uh, squeezer for the cassava bread. So now reading between the thread of the evidence, well, looking at the components of the Colección Gaspar Roca, Anografía YY, three lines of evidence surface and guided the analysis achieved. The associated documentation from Peter Rose field notes help understand the purpose of the expedition and the objects originally gathered from the ones that survived and are currently in the collection. Within the objects in the collection, the patterns identified by Soraya Serra in her analysis of Wekwait Burenes are incorporated and in weave in a plethora of ways, highlighting their versatility. And lastly, the detailed and rich ethnographic photographs by George Pimentor captures the still stories of the white, white people, the ways in which materials were chosen, and how weaving was incorporated even in the elaboration of ephemeral architecture, a life based on the interlocking chains, knots, and plating of fibers. And I wanted to divide it in these three uh, type of, uh, of phases because it is going to be also the way that the collection is. So collections usually, they have the material uh, culture. So you have the objects, but it is almost or sometimes or hopefully always <laughs> accompanied by documentation. Documentation is a very essential part of a collection and it becomes part of the collection um, just because it helps us understand how the collection was formed and the connection the, the collection has in itself. Without the documentation, looking at a collection becomes a puzzle very, very hard to decipher. And sometimes, like you can see in this pie chart, it is one of the parts of the collection that least survives to the present day. So for this collection, the majority of the collection, thankfully, uh, as you can see, 78% have been the photographs. Around 17% 17, 17 are the objects, and then very, very little has been of the documentation. So from that 78%, I can say that 1,500 uh, photographs have been um, rescued and preserved. And I've seen all of them and scanned them as well, just to have that uh, ease of access for future researchers. From the objects, we've managed to rescue around 330. Originally, there were 328, 
recently I uh, got the chance to see two other objects that were mixed with the other two collections that we managed to separate and um, helping with the registration and accession process of those two other objects. And then the documentation, if I managed to see 40 to 50 documents, it was um, saying a lot. Um, there was not a lot of documentation that was saved, but from the one that was saved, there was a lot of photocopies of field notes that helped uh, not only the personnel of the museum, but myself to better understand each of the objects, the connections that they have, and to try to create a narrative that would help us understand how the collection was formed, for what purpose, and how we could better preserve it for present and future researchers, specifically for the present. Sometimes we think a lot about the future, but we don't think a lot about how we can aid uh, present communities with this information and these materials. And if there's any Taino, Indigenous, or Arawaks that want to also access these objects as part of their own heritage, they would want this information to be as much accessible and as clear as possible. So for me, that's what we need to focus our efforts on. And within the associated documentation, the world why became such a fundamental research within the Centro de Investigaciones Indígenas de Puerto Rico, that it became their logo based on a photo of a white white person, probably a male perceived person, then drawn by Peter Rowe, framed within a crown of geometric shapes found in various objects from the community. So the associated documentation was entirely scanned, um, physically was organized by type and function, and it was uh, done by the use of respect the fonts method. So that method, what it entails is that the documents are going to be kept in the same order in which they were found in relations to, um, let's say that you have a letter that it is next to a report. So you're going to want to keep the letter next to the report just because maybe that letter talks about uh, information that it is related to the report. If you separate them just because you think that all the letters should be kept together and all of the reports should be kept together, there should be a report on the work that you're doing just so that people can understand why you made those decisions of separating one information from the other. Respect the fonts is just one method that some archivists use just to respect the way that the documents were originally um, archived and to respect the way that they uh, originally were built within that narrative, which is very important to, for us to also understand why and how these events happened. Another thing that was very important was to find these different documents that I uh, put in this slide and how they connect. So I already knew about the logo from brochures and from other um, promotional documentation that the Centro had, but I didn't know about Peter Rowe's drawings and many sketches of this photo that was uh, taken by George Pimentor of a YY person uh, when they did the expedition and how uh, it eventually became the logo of the Centro in general. So the design also incorporates a pattern that it is very uh, particular from the Huawei communities because they repeat it in a lot of the objects that they do, not only the wood patterns, but they also do it in uh, different uh, wood objects that I managed to see within the collection. Within Peter Rose, a few notes, there was a lot of information that really uh, helped aid uh, the accession of the collection, specifically because he kept a, a small journal where he added not only the, the names with the functions of the objects, but the name in Arawak of each of the objects. And he also included the name of the person or the name of the family that was responsible of doing that object in particular. So with that information, I'm not only looking at a squeezer for cassava bread, I am looking at an object that has an Arawak name and I'm looking at an object that was made by this particular family. So that was another very important uh, 
I think that um, information to also have because it gives you a closer connection with the people that originally made these objects and to they to whom they belong. Uh, various uh, of these uh, documents um, were all kept in diverse ways. Um, and just to put them together, all, almost all of them were kept together within that order, but it was a little bit of a hassle just to understand, okay, this folder has this and this box has this other thing because a lot of the labels, labels were perishable or they were um, full of acid, so they fell off. And just to retrieve all that information was a little bit of a puzzle, but we managed to recover the most that we could. Um, another thing that was very interesting to know within the few notes, specifically of Peter Rowe, was the communications that he had with the community. So originally the plan for, from him was that he wanted to commission objects uh, that they could incorporate in this collection that they were creating. So for example, the squeezer or a fire fan, they wanted to commission that to pay the community to make those objects so they could take them with them. So it was very interesting to know the phrasing and the way that they that he um, talked about it because he said that they didn't understood what he was trying to, to do. There was like a miscommunication. The thing is that when he asked them that he wanted these objects in particular, they did them in smaller sizes. So it was replicas in sort of toy type of size. And it was very interesting because he, he really wanted the large size objects. And they questioned him, why do you want something that you're not going to use? So I can make you a Swifter. I can make you a Squizzer for cassava bread, but why would I make it like, you know, like, its original size if you're not gonna use it. So for me, that was very interesting to see. What they managed to uh, eventually um, make a, like a type of retreat with the, with the community that they were going to keep the objects that were going to be discarded. So some of the objects uh, were made for the collection and some of them were just objects that maybe broke with use they were going to be discarded and then they decided to keep them. So that was a, another thing that I found that was very uh, interesting. And all of that from the associated documentation. So anyone that's an archaeologist, please, please, please keep your associated documentation and document everything, everything. Even if there's something that you say, oh, like this is like, everyone knows this. This is like, you know, you know, sentido como, like common sense. No, it's not common sense. I can guarantee you, that in two years, three years, no one is going to understand the system that you implanted. And I can guarantee you that people are gonna be very confused. So it's very important to document everything. Why do you put that number there? Why do you uh, want it to organize the files in this particular way? Why do you want it to keep this and not this? It is very, very important. There's no such thing as too much documentation or too much of us, you know, like creating this guide for present and future generations. Just think about if someone is going to access this uh, collection, how can I make them easier for them to understand my train of thought? So anyway, um, weaving patterns. Weaving as an essential technique and knowledge within a community was incorporated into the creation of diverse quotidian items that range from objects for the preparation of food to musical instruments as the maraca that you can see on the right. So as you can see, uh, weave patterns were used in so many, so many objects. Not only musical instrument like the maraca that I also saw it in coconut, but it was very interesting to see it in a weave pattern, but also fire fans that are still widely used today. Um, they give you a control of the fire um, that you can uh, bring more oxygen to the fire and ignite it more. Um, then you have also the baskets, different types of baskets with different types of weaves, the sifters and the cassava covers that can be used for so many other things. And then I want this part of our journey 
to be dedicated to various examples of the wheat patterns previously studied and identified by Soraya Serra Collazo and the various ways in which they surface among a diverse array of objects. This first pattern is simple. It's a simple interlock of loose knots with a spiral twist, which is normally found in nets and in this case, in this enhanced photo of a amaga or hammock. The reference that I used to identify the distinctive patterns was the 1995 Irene Emir's book, The Primary Structures of Fabrics and Illustrated Classification. From all the books that I managed to uh, try to use as a reference or as a guide, this was the one that I identified that had the most types of uh, patterns within weave and textile structures that could really give me a vast array to identify the ones that I was trying to identify within the collection and to make these uh, connections as well. So what you're seeing is a Buren fragment that has a very similar pattern to the interlocking of knots with a twist. Um, as you can see in the photos of the uh, Irene Mir's 1995 book. And then you can see a hammock from the collection that has this same pattern. And this pattern, we have seen it in so many places all around uh, the streets, our houses, in different types of uh, objects, of everyday objects. And it is a millinery type of technique that sometimes we just look around and don't maybe acknowledge or we don't honor the ancestry that goes within that type of technology and production. Um, another thing that I wanted to add is that that book that I mentioned from Eden Emeris, I managed to access it to, uh, through archive.org. So if anyone's interested, you can all, you can type the Eden Emeris 1995 and put uh, primary structures or fabrics and you're gonna be able to access it you need to uh, shake it out every certain time, but it works pretty well. One of the most uh, present and used patterns in both the Burenes and the YY objects is the twill or plating weave pattern. It is called twill weave or plating weave. Uh, in this case, it is incorporated as a structural design for a fire fan. Curious to know that fire fans had diverse patterns and all the ones present in the collection had, had a unique design. So this is very interesting because um, the making of fans is very uh, important and very personal because with fans, you could communicate different types of things. In this case, this pattern, uh, if you can see in the center from the uh, photo on the left, it begins with a triangle that then expands. And that's the general design of this particular fire fan. You're going to see with other objects that the same weave pattern, the same tool weave is going to be used to uh, create different types of designs, um, which is very interesting because it talks about how, how uh, versatile it's at the end. This same weave pattern, Soraya Serra, uh, managed to find it in the imprint of a Buren. Um, she was the one who uh, identified the type of pattern, uh, but then in the investigations of Imon Narganes and Chalate uh, Bike, they already had identified that the imprints that the Buren had on their bottoms were from uh, impressions of possible uh, diverse textiles and basketry within the Wekwe community. So it is very interesting to see how maybe we don't have the fire fan or we don't have the cassava cover, but we have the imprint. So we have the footprint that that was there. And with that footprint, we can trace so much information from the daily life and quotidian life or, or our indigenous ancestors and how, and this is the part that for me is uh, most emotional and, and personal and that I love more, is how it has managed to survive through so many uh, years, decades of oppression, um, systematic racism and colonization. 
So it is a true intergenerational muscular memory that has a right to this day. Let's do the next. So this is the tool we use in another object that if you can see in the center of the cassava cover, it forms a diamond. And the diamond stands when it reaches the end of the object. It is the same way pattern, but creates a different design. So it talks about how versatile it is. And you can see the comparison with the wooden fragments and with the image in the uh, Irene Mir's uh, book as well. Uh, this one to add towards the creativity and versatility that this technique gives the creator, both cassava covers present the same technique forming two different designs. So the one in the left has the diamond because it's the same image as the one before, but then the one in the right has a more distinctive uh, and very popular type of design that similar to a meander or meandro in Spanish found in, and it's very uh, similar to the one that's found in Greek culture and throughout different indigenous communities in the Americas. So this particular design, um, it was also incorporated in the logo of the Centro de Investigaciones Indígenas de Puerto Rico because of how much you could see it in very different uh, objects. Um, and it is also a very similar geometric rectangular um, type of design that you can see it in other cultures as well. Um, in some cultures, it is believed that it resembles uh, the passing of water and it resembles uh, geometric shapes that you can also see in nature, which is very cool as well. Um, and in here you can see it and I compare it with an enlarged image of the wooden because even though it's not the same design, it is the same pattern and how versatile it has been. My hypothesis is that maybe one of these cassava covers in the times of our indigenous ancestors was used as a base to put the clay on top, uh, mold the buren, and then lift it up onto the place where it was going to be cooked. And that pressing of the clay and lifting up was going to make the imprints of the clay in the bottom of the wooden. And that's why we have it to this day. Very cool, very cool. And here you can see as well the, uh, the pattern that it creates. That is the same one, but with a different design. Pretty cool, pretty cool. These cassava covers are pretty big. They seem small in the photo, but they are they are pretty large. I had very fun time moving them by myself. Very fun time. Anyway, let's continue. And we have the twill weaves still, but within basketry. And it is this is a very similar um type of design with a lace work plating. So what happens here? Um, in this particular design, you can see similar patterns were also used for multiple purposes and even were incorporated in the same object. In this case, the sifter shown in the top right center has two distinctive designs for the granulation of food in diverse stages. The outer center has the same two weave I've illustrated before, but with a closer look we can see the incorporation at the inner center of a lace work plating commonly used in basketry. So the center of the sifter has a lace work plating. And then when you reach the edges, it changes to a twill weave. And the, this gives you different types of granulations, as I mentioned, for the preparation of food, which is very interesting to see how you can have in one object different types of weaving patterns um, and how versatile uh, the weave pattern, the technology and the production of it is. Yes, and then, so continuing with uh, the other section of the collection, which is uh, a very important section and one that really uh, gives a little bit more life to all the other parts that I've shown is the ethnographic, the ethnographic photos. For this one, I continue using the respect the font method to respect the way that uh, 
the photos were organized. They all have a uh, number, specific number. Almost all of them start with 80, 85.2, and then the other sequence. Uh, some of them started with 85.1. Why did they make that change? And why did they use th these types of numbers? I still don't have a clue. I tried to go through the documentation a um, couple of times, but I haven't found a document that explains why they use this type of structure within the um, you know, numbers of the objects in the photos. Something that we managed to see when we were doing the accessioning of the collection was that some of the objects had written in permanent marker some of these numbers. So I found some correlations between some photos and the objects. I think that maybe they were trying to have the object and some photos of the process of the object as a sort of way of telling the stories of the creation of each of the objects that you were going to see, um, which was very interesting. So the photos in particular, they were all scanned. Uh, physically, they were all organized uh, within the numbers and they were divided uh, depending on their type. So the index cards were all kept in one box. Uh, and then the uh, sheets, the record sheets that were eight by uh, 11 and a half uh, inches, uh, they were all kept in a folder and each of the sheets was kept in a uh, type of uh, a plastic acid free bag uh, that was provided in the museum. Um, they had some that they were not using and I managed to score a couple for this collection. Um, so these photos in particular, some of them were um, in color, other ones were in black and white, as you can see with the one in the left, and the one in the middle were a couple that were negatives. Um, there was not a large number of negatives, but they uh, did have like a comprehensive part of the uh, photographic collection uh, overall. But it was very interesting to see them. Uh, just because of what I'm going to show you next. Lastly, ephemeral architecture, which can only be traced in the Caribbean archaeological record by the mark left behind of the main poles that held the structure together, which illustrates in these images the ingenuity and complexity of their structure, their construction abilities. The horizontal and vertical wooden poles seem to form a loom to which the diverse leaves will be later weaved together. With the collaborative work of the male presenting or perceived figures of the community, rows of leaves are incorporated into the initial loom of the structure to be clothed. Hypothetically, this technique can be identified as a simple looping where the fibers and leaves are looped onto a rigid foundation with interlocked stitches to secure the relationship between materials created. With these images, it's evident how a female architecture known by the Dainos in the Caribbean as Canes and Boillos are weaved clothed spaces where the community resided. Thus, weaving was not only used for the elaboration of clothes and quotidian objects, but became an essential element of, of the spaces as well in which they lived. Uh, for me, it was a very um, amazing way of truly understanding the architecture and the engineering behind the construction of boillos and canes. Because usually when, you know, in Puerto Rico, we got a history books they would show and depict images of boyos as very tiny, very, um, very, very tiny and constricted spaces. But then when you see these images and you see this one in particular, and you see the, the engineering and the architecture and how not only well thought, but the way that it was all conceived, you get a very different perspective of how these spaces were as well as how huge they were. Not all of them were made to be lived in. Some of them were made for 
uh, communal gatherings, and some of them were made for community gatherings because they were related to um, to cooking food or to doing um, um, different types of fabrics or textiles within looms. So it is another way of understanding how um, versatile our communities actually were and now how monolithic sometimes um, the official narratives of history want to tell us. So particularly this, because I've never seen, uh, well, I've never seen before this collection, a sort of naked uh, boyo or the part of the loom of the boyo. It is a very nice way to understanding um, how it was dressed, how you can see it in this way, how it was intertwined, how it was weaved. And it just makes us understand that their spaces of cohabiting were huge looms where they all weave them together. And it is also a metaphor of how life was and still is within indigenous communities in the Caribbean. So as a closing remarks for my presentation, this study proposes an alternative to the, an alternative to the curatorial crisis by going back to collections to conduct research rather than the accumulation of new material culture. Presented as a non-invasive approach to the study of archeological and ethnographic evidence, it focuses on how weave patterns reflect on the persistence of intergenerational muscular memory throughout Puerto Rican history. As a note, this research was conducted without financial support, which highlights the use and reuse of the materials cultural professionals have on their disposal to conduct research, but also demonstrates the scarcity of resources available. This is very important to note. Furthermore, more research is needed to understand these collections, full capabilities to reconstruct Puerto Rico's indigenous weave inheritance, alive today, as well as experimental archaeology and comparative analysis with contemporary artisans in Puerto Rico. Regardless of the adversities from natural disasters to colonial wounds, Caribbean heritage from indigenous communities have managed to survive three generations and still alive to this day. It is within an intergenerational memory of community building and constant cultural affirmation that indigenous knowledge such as textile and weaving techniques, still important in the present day, are a constant reminder of diverse ways to record history, other than the reading Western system, as a thread that goes in circles, knots itself up, and creates a web of possibilities where we have lived, are living, and will live, the embodiment of comfort and familiarity became intertwined in the textiles of our memories and the continuous nerve web of our hippocampus, where we store memory in our brain. Just as photographs have a nostalgic aura viewed as objects of memory, likewise textiles as the physical past, present, and future can be viewed as a form of creating identity and community building. These stories of resistance are way patiently to be read between the threads. And this part I'm gonna read it in Spanish because the way that I retrieve it was in Spanish. Los tejidos son los libros que no pudo quemar la colonia y que viven en la memoria de generaciones tejidas, tejiendo y por tejer. And that's my presentation. And thank you to all the people that have, uh, in some way or another, helped me uh, with this research that it's going to uh, be a little bit bigger in the continuous years uh, to have this access to this amazing connection to connect with ancestors that are very related to my ancestors was a very special space to be in, a very emotional space to be in as well. Um, and also to all the people that I've met because of this collection has been just an amazing experience to have uh, in Puerto Rico and in New York, um, the communities that I have built and the people that have left their memories and have left their thread within the loom of my life has been a very special, emotional, and beautiful experience to also have. I feel that uh, when you do work with your ancestry and your heritage, it's become something that's very powerful and personal because you're working towards something that has a call for action. 
So I eventually want my work to reach to other communities, to work with indigenous communities in Puerto Rico, and to um, try to advocate for this technologies that we've had for so many, many, many generations and that need and will still be alive for many more. So anyway, thank you everyone. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions, but I think that I'm gonna stop sharing now, if that's okay. Um, thank you, Helenia. And yes, if anybody has any questions, you can either unmute yourself or you can go ahead and write it on the chat and we can read it out loud. I do have a question. So one question that I had was, was there a research outside of the field notes and the collection that you use to supplement your uh, theories or your conclusions? Yeah, um, thank you for your question. Um, so one of the first things that I did was to talk to people that have a lot more experience in this type of field than me. So I talked to my supervisor at the time when I was working at the museum, so Dr. Yvonne Narganes Torbe, because she had a different type of uh, connection with this collection in particular, and to also have her expertise in the Murenes that I wanted to also see. Um, then when I was talking to her, I also got in touch with Dr. Soraya Serrano eh, Collazo, who's an expert in Puerto Rico in conservation in textiles. And she has written uh, not only um, and published articles, but she also has a book that's uh, based on cotton in Puerto Rico, the history of cotton in Puerto Rico. So that I think that was one of the first things that I did. And that's how I got the idea for the uh, master thesis um, that became a live research project thing became a work thing and became then a research life project thing. Um, one thing led to another, and then I got in touch with a lot of other people within the textile community um, that they helped in some way and in some other way, it was not exactly what I was looking for. Sometimes when I tell people that I want to work with textiles in the Caribbean, they only think about um, the ones that I have seen in Mexico or in Mesoamerica, or they think about cotton. But I'm also looking at weave patterns because those ones are the ones that I think that we need to retrieve more. Um, I'm not saying that textiles, you know, made in cotton and linen are not important, but the ones that I'm focused more are in weave patterns. Um, so when I, I talked to Soraya and with Yvonne, they were the ones that actually helped me uh, gather more references. Um, I am a huge advocate thinking that I am not discovering, you know, anything new. I'm just adding to the conversation. So I need to go back to the people that have been doing this for ages and seeing their expertise and what else can I bring to the table to discuss. Not to just say like what I'm saying is law, but just to add things to the dis discussion, you know, to the table so that we can understand our heritage a little bit better. Um, so when I was talking to them, actually, that's how I managed to get to Irene Semir's book because um, it was a suggestion. And then when I got to that book, I also researched um, different types of archaeological methods for studying textiles in other regions and in other climates. Because depending on the climate, the preservation of the textile is going to be very different. So that's another thing that for me was very curious. And to also understand that in other uh, spaces, textiles have also been preserved in clay um, as an imprint. And some of the uh, ceramics and objects in ceramic, the designs that they have, they replicate those textiles and those uh, weave patterns. So that was another way that I managed to also gather information that was going to aid me within the process of you know, doing the research. Another thing that really helped was that I took an archive, intro to archive course uh, in NYU that really helped me with the associated documentation. Because doing that, you know, like with no information of how archives so work whatsoever is not so easy. So when I was taking the class, I took a lot of notes, I made a lot of questions, and then I had that in you know the top of my mind when I was going to access the documentation. 
Nonetheless, I'm doing this inside a museum. So they have a different system that a library or an archive is going to have. So another thing that I did was to consult with the archivist in the museum, see how she does her job and to see how could I do this for this collection. This is very tricky because usually this is not something that's done usually within archaeological collections. Um, not all uh, archaeologists that work with um, collections have an expertise in archives or know about archives. And working with an associated documentation, it is very different than working with the objects. And the way that you're going to arrange it is very different than how you work with the objects. So that was another thing that I had to also have that dialogue and communication between the chief archivist and the chief archaeologist and then the museologist within the whole space. So I feel that, yeah, you know, having references like books and having articles is very important, but talking to people, that's like the most important thing because the book is going to tell you so many things that when you're in the museum, that's not going to happen. <laughs> You know, they have the ideal. And then you go to the museum or the repository or you have your collection and everything is just upside down, you know? Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any other question? Somebody said Sorry. something? I have okay. a quick, I have a quick question, Helena. Thank you so much for your presentation and, you know, for your comments about uh, how important it is to talk to, you know, living communities as well just now. Um, you know, it's so important to remember for us as archaeologists, right, that there are, uh, our work doesn't just exist in the past, right, it um, can be informed and impact uh, living communities. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, you mentioned early in your presentation, the importance of really, you um, explaining like your database and your notes so that people in the future would, and and you said something that was like really depressing like two years from now people won't understand what you meant and I was wondering if you could kind of does that come from a specific experience or maybe you could discuss that a little bit or what we should be doing as archaeologists to make sure uh you know people will understand us for at least like five to ten years <laughs> yeah sure um so for example, when I was working with this collection, um, I did a report on everything, every decision that I took regarding the collection. So one of the things that I did, for example, is that I hand you each of the objects. This was my decision just because um, I did the accessible photos of each of the objects at that moment. And I needed to document where the original uh, numbering was with every and each of the objects. And I knew that it was going to be easier for the archaeologist if she saw the sheets with the information of each of the objects to see the image of that object in particular and not see, you know, 10 times Buren or um, Squeezer because there were like 10 or 15 squeezers, but each of them was different. So I hand you each of them. What I did is that in my final report, I wrote a note saying why I made that decision and how to read those drawings. And I also explained why I use the, um, um, the numbers that I use to identify is each of the objects, why I organize them the way they organize them. I even went on to saying I decided decide to put everyone based on typology and material um, and size. So this is the one that I, the way that they are going to be organized. And even if they are not organized in that way, that's the way they are going to be registered. So eventually, because this is something, you know, human nature does, you're going to put everything by number. So I managed to uh, assemble everything and um, register everything in a way that is going to be easy um, as well to move and to assemble in that same exact way. Um, so all the things that I did, I put them in a final report um, that was very, very detailed. I had the opportunity, and this is not the opportunity, that everyone's going to have to also be in the uh, donation process of the collection. So I managed to see the collection when it was all scrambled and it was a mess onto us trying to stabilize it the best way that we could. 
Um, so being in that process and working with a company that helped us move the boxes and, and knowing the history uh, of that movement um, also helped me write that final report. So that every single tell that you can incorporate in making, you know, it can be um, a Word document or it can be um, entering uh, daily logs on everything that you're doing. That's something also that I did and it helped me a lot. I did entry logs and daily logs of everything that I was doing each and every day. And that way it was like keeping like a few, you know, notebook, but for the collection. And that helped me a lot to understand the steps that I was taking. And if I had to go back to change something because the decision that I was making was really not beneficial but for this collection in particular. So another thing that I've noticed working with collections is that each collection is unique. So each collection is going to present its own um, challenges and one needs to work within those challenges. Um, so maybe this works because the collection was not that big, but maybe a different method should be implied or implemented with a different type of collection. The other thing to note is very important. I was doing all this by myself with minimal help and aid from other uh, personnel because the museum doesn't have a lot of staff that has a knowledge in archaeology and that can do this type of work. So that's another thing that's very important to also see that, you know, this is an extra effort that I was doing just because I was thinking about tomorrow someone is going to see this. How can I make this as simple as I can? If I'm not here and I'm not here to explain it, how can I uh, document this as much as I can so that you can go back? One thing that I did was I wrote the report. I gave it to someone else to read it. And I was like, okay, if I give you this, do you understand why I made the decision? Can you go back to see this and this other thing? And that really helped me also to make it as simple as possible, to remove all the jargon and to just, you know, say it as it is. Um, I feel like when we're working with collections, sometimes we're just like being very, because it's a very repetitive work. Um, and sometimes you take decisions and you make decisions that you don't record because for you, it's just like, you know, everyone is going to do this. Everyone's going to put all these objects because they're the same size together, but not everyone's going to do it that way. So it's very important for us to document even the most simplest and smallest step. I even documented the days that I was not in the repository because I was doing other type of work because I think that for me right now, maybe it's not important, but from, you know, like three, four years, someone is going to go back and maybe something happened in Puerto Rico and that relates to that. And maybe it is important for the conservation of the object, the handling of the object. I don't know what, but I know that it's going to be important. So I don't know if that answered the question. That's it. Yeah, thank you so much. Answer. That was great. I really okay. appreciate that. <laughs> um, um, I also have a question, but um, we also have a good comment uh, that Janet by wrote. Um, I don't know if that's a question, if you want to make it into a question, but personally, I just feel like, you know, it is, I am always very impressed and very happy when this type of decolonial work is being done in Puerto Rico, because unfortunately, colonial interpretations of our past have really affected how we can relate and connect with our indigenous heritage. And it's very, very limited, um, the opportunities that we have to actually hear these different interpretations and be able to like, like you mentioned earlier, make them relevant and use them in the present rather than just thinking about the future, the future, but then nobody actually, you know, when is the future and when can we actually, uh, determine when to use that. Um, so my question is, and as someone who is from the Southwest part of the archipelago, so for me to have access to like the Museum of Layubi, I would have to travel like three hours. <laughs> um, how do you envision or have you, or do you think or have any ideas of how we can make this stories, this interpretations, this particular indigenous heritage, which is being beautifully uh, you know, studied, how can we share it with 
wider community so that more people can learn from it and connect. Of course. But Mira, I want to start answering that question with something that I feel that repositories and museums always like lean to. And they always lean to doing exhibitions because you know you can display the objects and you can move them around and you can have like a traveling exhibition and et cetera, et cetera. And that works up to a certain length. Um, not everyone goes to museums. Um, and I've seen that, you know, working within museums. Um, you can make them as accessible as you want. You can have this amazing, you know, programming. You can, you know, make this amazing outreach not everyone's gonna go. And maybe the targeted audience that you want is not going to visit the museum because of how museums have been built and what they you know, um, represent. And they have a lot of colonial races and oppressive structures that intimidate people to go, specifically indigenous communities, specifically in that I've seen in Puerto Rico. Um, I feel that in this case, I don't think that there's one answer. You can do the exhibitions and the travel exhibitions, but maybe a public program in this more based in making artwork. Artwork uh, that's related with workshops that um, let people, you know, like do these types of patterns and techniques. And those workshops are done in Puerto Rico. Um, usually they're done in places in Puerto Rico where indigenous communities um, and indigenous knowledge is a lot more well preserved than in other parts of Puerto Rico, like in El Area Metro, um, in San Juan. I've seen some museums, um, like the Museo del Contemporáneo, that has done some efforts in um, trying to add that to their programming. Um, and I think that there's another museum, I don't remember which one, that is also trying to incorporate um, for people to, to know and to understand and to actually learn how to do weave patterns. Um, so that's pretty cool. I know of a friend who's a teacher uh, that she was teaching her students how to do weave patterns in her classes uh, from local artisans and from local uh, indigenous people in Puerto Rico. So that's a really cool way of doing it because people like doing things with their hands. And yeah, you want to see the object, but you want to touch it and you want to know how it was used and you want to have a more immersive and interactive experience with your heritage. So yeah, you can have your exhibition, you can display the objects, that would be really cool. And I hope um, that the museum does it eventually, but I feel that that should be one part of the public programming. You should also incorporate other ways that are a little bit more neurodivergent for a neurodivergent audience. That in my case, I learn by touching and I learn by other ways. So if I see something, um, I, I want to touch it just because that's the way that I am going to understand it better. Or I draw it because that's the way that I'm going to memorize better how the different patterns are going to be connected. So I feel that you know understanding the necessities of the community will be a better way. And we have the resources. There's a lot of indigenous artisans in Puerto Rico that know this, that have this knowledge, and that are very open to teaching it to other people. Um, and one thing that for me worked when I was doing the research is that since I've known that my parents know these uh, types of patterns, I asked them, I was like, mommy, how do you call this? Like, what do you think of this? Ah, yeah, yeah, I seen that in, in a chair in I don't know where, and it is called Mimbre, or this one is called I don't know what. And that was another interesting way of seeing how they, you know, connect, they're not from museums, they're not from, you know, academic world, but how they connect it with something that they're seeing every single day. So I feel this connection has a lot of potential because it's something that we're seeing every single day. So just connecting with, you know, the people and, what they want more than what you think that they want. I think that that's the most important thing of public programming. So that was a long answer, but yeah. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much. I agree with everything and I look forward to having the opportunity the next time I'm back home to participate of some of these art workshops. Ah, I'm very excited. Um, and once again, Elenia, I want to thank you for spending this 
little bit of the morning with us drinking a nice cup of coffee or tea and sharing with us your incredible, incredible work. Um, so once again, thank you. And for all of you who are, you know, who made it to our virtual cafecito lecture, I want to thank you as well. We have one more lecture for next week, next Monday, if you're interested. I have shared on the comments our website, our Honrando Nuestra Historia program, if you're interested and if you're in the area of Florida, or if you want to participate again in our virtual cafecito lectures, there's still opportunity for some more. And know that all of the lectures are going to be published as well on our YouTube. So if you're interested in any uh, of the other programs that have already passed, you will be able to enjoy them as well at some point. Um, so Thank you so much, Helenia. Muchísimas, muchísimas gracias. And I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day.